Okay, it's time to commit. 2024 is the year for prioritizing yourself. Begin your new smile journey with Byte, and you could start seeing results in just two to three weeks. Just order your at-home impression kit today for only $14.95 at Byte.com. Byte Clear Aligners are doctor-directed and delivered to your door. Treatment costs thousands less than braces. Plus, they offer financing options, accept eligible insurance, and you can pay with your HSA, FSA. Get 80% off your impression kit when you use code WONDERY at Byte.com. That's B-Y-T-E dot com. Start your confidence journey today with Byte. Hi, everybody. Cheryl Ackeson here. I hope you enjoy this special From the Archives edition of Full Measure After Hours. Hi, everybody. Cheryl Ackeson here. Welcome to another edition of Full Measure After Hours. Today, we hear from a lead official with the Catholic Jesuits about why they've started paying reparations to descendants of slaves that the Jesuits once purchased to build what's now Georgetown University. Reparations, such an interesting topic. One definition I read of reparations reads, the making of amends for a wrong one has done by paying money or otherwise helping those who have been wronged. But this controversy has to do with someone being asked to pay for wrongs they never committed or were even associated with, but accepting blame for those they never met, paying those who never met the ones who were wronged. I think this is a perfect full measure story. I always try to set out with an idea to find out about something and then research it, listen to what people have to say, rather than doing, I think, what so many reporters do today, they come up with an idea on the front end of what they want a story to say. They sort of fill in the blanks and then try to convince you. Well, that's not what we do. And if you watch Full Measure, you know that this story that you'll see on Sunday will give you a lot of different viewpoints and you will make up your own mind what you think afterwards. That'll be Sunday, January 30th. An in-depth look at the topic, which even has black civil rights activists on opposing sides. You'll hear from a slave descendant named Melisanda Short Cologne. You'll hear from a man named Robert Woodson, who opposes reparations. But right now in this podcast, you're going to hear from a Catholic Jesuit priest about why the Jesuits are already paying reparations and what form that takes. Here is Father Timothy Kosicki. So Jesuits have always known our history of slaveholding in the United States, but in 2016, we came face to face with living descendants of slaveholding in Maryland and other states, and particularly descendants of a sale, a sale of 272 women, men, and children in 1838. That encounter with living descendants changed the history. There's an adage that there's my truth, your truth, and the truth. For years, we had been studying our history of slaveholding from our knowledge. Suddenly, we were hearing the experience and the truth from the hearts and the minds of living descendants. And that began a process of reconciliation and transformation. Did they... um Did they get in contact when you said you came face to face? Was there a protest or an organized approach? Well, a lot of the genesis of this began at Georgetown University. And in 2015, they chose to study their history of slaveholding. Others then began to study the archaeological records. And if there's a silver lining through this, it's that someone not only wrote the first names, but the family names, the surnames of the enslaved persons, particularly related to the sale. And so now you, you could f- find a link, your family, to this historic family. The Jesuits did not first meet the descendants. Uh, to be honest with you, many of the descendants found out their genealogy from an article in the New York Times, which aired in April of 2016. And at first, the locus was Georgetown University because it's a high-profile institution. and much of the slave labor, labor from enslaved persons, and the sale helped 
to benefit Georgetown University. But over time, the defendants studied this history and recognized you know, it was the Jesuit order that was the primary actor. So it was to the Jesuits they came to begin a process of reconciliation. Was there any resistance at first, or did the Jesuits embrace this process once it unfolded? Conversion takes a lot of time, and I think that the two initial feelings, I would say, were shame and fear. It's very shameful history, and there's a fear. How, how can you reconcile? And there's nothing more gut-wrenching than meeting someone whose ancestors you owned and sold. But over a year of conversations before we began a formal dialogue process, relationships began. And I would say that relationships were the key to moving from shame and fear to constructive engagement. What is going to be the reconciliation or the reparation, if you will? What's been decided? So there were multiple descendant groups, and we could never quite agree. <laughs> So we, we went to the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, who specialized in truth, racial healing, and transformation, and they sponsored a formal dialogue process. And that was their mantra, truth, racial healing, and transformation. So first, the three descendant groups met, then Jesuits and representatives from Georgetown met, and then we met together to arrive at a way forward. And they were very clear, two things. One, they said, look, we're not gonna beat you up about your past, we will about your future. And they also said this, look, we don't want to sell our ancestors twice. We want something significant, but that doesn't put money in our pockets, but invests in our, our descendants' future. And so they asked us to partner with them in a foundation, which has now been launched, the Descendants Truth and Reconciliation Foundation, which has three foci, racial healing, the educational aspirations of descendants, and care for elderly uh, and infirmed uh, descendants. Is that something that's going to be built and developed or it's already going strong? It has been incorporated. The Jesuits have already deposited $15 million into the trust, whose sole beneficiary is the foundation. And we have uh, engaged a major fundraising firm, CCS, to raise $100 million within Jesuit networks and the goal is to build a billion dollar foundation. So the Jesuits have agreed to raise a hundred million in the next three to five years and then go beyond the Jesuit world to capitalize a billion dollar foundation. So reparations in the context of what we're talking about today means moving forward with healing and opportunities and education rather than paying cash to the descendants? That is correct. And I, I can tell you we did not know what to do, but through a dialogue process with descendant leaders, we realized we couldn't meet with every descendant. With descendant leaders, they were very clear, we want you to make a bold investment in something forward. There is no price, they said to me, there's no price we can put on what you did in the past, but we expect you, using your, your largesse, to invest in the future. When we hear talk across the nation now of reparations, it may mean different things. In yes. Illinois, in Evanstown, it may mean actually cash payments. It could mean in other places something closer to what you said you're doing. What do you think about that in the larger context, the conversation about reparations? I think as a nation, we are still learning how to reconcile with our past. Uh, I don't know that there have been many serious efforts in the United States at reconciling with slaveholding. There have been many efforts to study our history, and I think there have been many projects within institutions to respond to it. But I believe this is the first time an institution like the Jesuits and descendants have started something new. It's not ours. It's not ex exclusively the descendants. It's something new. I'd say it's a model for moving forward, and we're very clear. We respect all models for repairing the damage that slavery has caused. Uh, however, this is the model that the descendant leaders from our past have invited us into, and we're proud to join with them on it. A few of you have asked how you can support independent journalism like you find at Full Measure and CherylAxon.com amid an increasingly managed and censored information landscape. At my website, 
Google Ads and Facebook have censored factual, footnoted, and cited posts, and Google demands daily that I remove dozens of pages from my website, which I won't do. These are factually accurate, cited news stories on topics that powerful interests apparently don't want you to know about. Well, now you can support off-narrative journalism by visiting the Cheryl Ackeson store at CherylAckeson.com for products that will tell the world you're an independent thinker And there are great gift ideas there for your independent thinking friends and family, too. Proceeds go to support a variety of independent journalism causes besides maintaining the website, including funding college journalism awards for independent, off-narrative student reporting. You can make a difference. We're back. Can you tell me with more any detail at all more about how slaves were brought here, what the Jesuits were doing at the time, how they were used. Did slaves literally build Georgetown University? Well, Jesuits came to the United States in the uh, 17th century. And really, Christianity, Catholicism, and slaveholding were intertwined. So initially, many families might send a son to become a Jesuit and with the son, the family would send two or three enslaved persons. I almost like to say, well, this is our contribution to uh, the Jesuit order. Over time, that enslaved labor grew. There were plantations in Maryland. Uh, the revenue from those plantations did help with all those early missions, the first, in a sense, the first churches, the first uh, schools. So there is a clear link between uh, slaveholding and the economy of slaveholding, and what helped the first Jesuit, Catholic, and overall Christian missions. Most most institutions of higher learning, for example, founded before emancipation, may have some connection to slaveholding. We spoke to, we are speaking to some critics that just don't think reparations are a good idea, including an African-American civil rights leader of his time who says he thinks this weakens of uh, African Americans today puts them in the position of having a handout instead of understanding that, he says, problems today in the black community have much to do with internal factors that they're not addressing. Well, I, 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 I can't, uh, as a white Catholic uh, priest, I, I can't speak uh, to the experience of African Americans, but I can say what I've learned uh, from uh, these descendants, and th- they've been very clear with me. Look, we're not looking for, for handouts. We're, we're looking for Jesuits to do what you've always done. You, you've always tried to be part of new initiatives that build a more just society, that repair the human family, that promote education, that care for the aged and infirm. They said, this is work of the church. We're just asking you to continue this work in partnership with us on something as noble as racial healing. I, I would say, again, speaking from the perspective of someone who is white, that the sin of racism is still prevalent, not just in our society, it's also prevalent in our churches. And it's going to take more than just a Sunday sermon to help heal it. I think it's going to take programs like this foundation to try to address it. Tell me about the apology. There was actually a formal statement made. In 2017, uh, around Emancipation Day in in Washington, D.C., there was uh, an event at Georgetown in which, uh, amongst other things, I apologized for the Jesuits' history of slaveholding. And some might ask, what does an apology do? I I think, first and foremost, it's a recognition that this happened, that we did this, and that it was wrong. And... You know, that, that's one step, because in the apology I said, we resist moving on, but embrace moving forward. And moving forward meant we had more work to do. But I think that that act of apologizing, of admission, and contrition can lay the ground for a fruitful partnership. Now, you might ask yourself, and I've certainly had this thought cross my mind, and I've heard other people say, why should we be talking about paying the descendants of slaves reparations before we talk about paying Native Americans reparations. In fact, there are a lot of categories of aggrieved populations who 
could argue that they are owed something. Well, this is one interesting thing I learned. You might not have heard as much about them, but billions of dollars in reparations of some kind have been paid already throughout American history. We can go back to 1848, when a freed black woman named Henrietta Wood, she was working as a housekeeper, when a white man kidnapped her back into slavery, supposedly took her back across state lines to a place where slavery was still in practice, held her for another, I think, couple of years. She was freed again after the Civil War. Well, she went to court, sued for damages and wages, and she won an award from an all-white jury. That's probably the first record of something that sounds anything like reparations as a result of slavery, paid directly to the person who was in slavery. Well, since then, looking around, there's been a lot of tax money, both at the federal, state, and local level. This paid for some kind of reparations program. Back in 1971, I didn't know this, maybe some of you did, but Alaska Native Americans got a billion dollars and 44 million acres of land as part of something called the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. Then in 1988, for example, American taxpayers gave $1.2 billion to living Japanese Americans who'd been held in detention camps during World War II. Again, this is money paid directly to the people who were injured, not to their descendants. But anyway, that money added up to about $20,000 per person given to 60,000 living Japanese Americans. I haven't heard anybody argue since then that the descendants of the Japanese Americans are owed something, although maybe that's because the originals were actually paid, those who are still living. As to whether there should be one big federal settlement for slavery, that remains to be seen. There have been congressional proposals, really proposals to study a federal reparations program, and that hasn't seemed to go anywhere. From the standpoint of the slaves and their descendants, there's an interesting website you might want to check out. It's got some fascinating original material on the subject. It's called slaveryarchive.georgetown.edu. Slaveryarchive.georgetown.edu. Let me just read you a little bit from one selection you will find there. It's called You May Sell Isaac. The Jesuits arranged the sale of Isaac Hawkins, an enslaved man jailed in Baltimore, 1843. The description of this item says, This series of letters from 1843 illustrates the Maryland Jesuits' attempts to sell Isaac, an enslaved man who appeared to be fugitive since the fall of 1838. The Jesuits received news of Isaac's whereabouts after he was arrested in Baltimore. The bailiff, Samuel H. Redgrave wrote to the Father Superior of the Maryland Jesuits in August of 1843, and after arranging the sale of Isaac, he received a commission of 20%. According to these letters, Isaac was sold to the person who owned his wife, Isaac's wife. Isaac was sold for $250. Before his sale, a Jesuit planned to meet with Isaac and asked the bailiff in Baltimore to assure Isaac in, quote, the name of his lawful masters that no violence at all, although the most legal, will be used in this regard. Then it includes the 1838 Bill of Sale that lists two enslaved men named Isaac, both of them members of the Hawkins family. Isaac Hawkins's fourth son ran away before the sale was completed, and the series of letters is assumed to be referring to him. And I will read from one page. Interesting to hear how they spoke to each other, how they really spoke, not in the movies, not just how we think they spoke to each other, but this is an actual letter. It says, this letter was written August 14th, 1843, to Bailiff Samuel Redgrave in Baltimore, even has the address. On next Wednesday morning, 16th, I intend to go to Baltimore and wish to speak with you about the affair you have communicated to me in your late visit here. But since the morning cars arrive at the ticket office at eight and a half, bet that means 8.30, and you told me that you would leave your house at eight, I wish you could call the Washington ticket office on Wednesday morning at the arrival of the Washington cars 
where I shall also wait for some time after the arrival of said morning cars in order to meet you there. Meanwhile, plan to arrange things in such a manner that after our meeting, I may have an opportunity of speaking with Isaac in your company or not, it is immaterial. You may assure him that no violence at all, although the most legal, will be used in his regard. I give this assurance in the name of his lawful masters. Please, therefore, if convenient, to arrange the affair in the above manner, in order that shortly after my arrival, I may conclude something and may have my time free for other affairs, having to return home by the evening cars. Another letter written, looks like a couple of weeks later, September 4th, 1843, to the same man, bailiff Samuel Redgrave in Baltimore, says, Owing to a temporary absence of the superior, I could not acknowledge sooner your letter dated August 25th. You may sell Isaac if we can agree on the price. Of this, however, I shall speak with you, as I may also enter in some arrangement concerning ten other servants, fugitives since the fall of 1838. I wish, therefore, to know if you will be in Baltimore next Monday, 11th. On your answer in the affirmative, you may expect me at the ticket office on said day at the arrival of the morning cars from Washington. There's some talk about paying the bailiff a commission of 20%, and then there is a letter in November from, again, the Jesuits to bailiff Samuel Redgrave that says, It seems that the best to be done is to accept the offer of $250 for Isaac as made by the owner of his wife. Send me, therefore, a model of the bill of conveyance of said servant, including, of course, the receipt of the $250. It will be signed by the president of the Board of Trustees of the Incorporated Catholic Clergy of Maryland. I shall return it to you, signed and retaining $50 for all your management in this affair. You will be pleased to pass the balance of $200 to Ed Jenkins and Sons Market Street near the BK, maybe that's Bank of Baltimore. To see these transactions for human beings in black and white, so to speak, is pretty stark. There are even copies of the actual documents in this cursive handwriting as preserved by the Jesuits. So interesting. So again, if you'd like to look around and find out more, there's further reading. There's information about descendants. Slaveryarchive.georgetown.edu. To hear more about both sides of this debate, I hope you'll check out my other podcast this week, the Cheryl Ackeson podcast, for some really fascinating interviews. And watch Full Measure this Sunday, January 30th, for my report on all of it. If you happen to be listening to this after January 30th, no problem. The piece will be posted at fullmeasure.news, fullmeasure.news. You can also see all of my cover stories if you go to CherylAckeson.com. Click the Full Measure tab, and that will lead you to a link for the cover stories I've been doing for now seven seasons. They're organized by general topic. You can binge watch, and I promise you, you will be surprised at all the news you've missed if you've just been watching the same basic TV channels or reading the same publications who tend to be on narrative and cover, even if they're covering different sides of a story, covering the same basic few topics. There's a lot more going on in the world. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Don't forget to visit CherylAckeson.com and the new store under the store tab at CherylAckeson.com for products that will help you support independent journalism and put a smile on your face and show people where you stand as an independent thinker. Do your own research, make up your own mind, think for yourself.